So thank you for the opportunity to discuss this set of papers. So I'd like to say just a couple of things before starting. So I'm a macroeconomist. I think I'm in the minority here. I think my former professor, Paul uh, Romer, is uh, the other macroeconomist. I think there are a few of us. Is Daron still here? Okay, Daron. Right. <laughs> but many, many, uh, there, there are some macroeconomists here, but I want to give the perspective that I have on, on these. Um, but the first one is that in fall 2008, I was teaching macro um, to undergraduates and graduate students, and I think one of the things that I had to do was to get rid of the syllabus uh, before the end of the uh, semester to uh, use more economic history. Our models were not working, that was clear, the students weren't learning anything, so we had to find something else to do. So um, another... <laughs> Uh, and we had to get through the semester. Um, in 2011, 2012, I was at CEA, and I think one of the things that Janet Yellen and I uh, talked about at least twice was what the agenda was for macroeconomics. So one of those was to try to figure out what macro models could do and what they couldn't do. Um, and it was also that we needed uh, to rethink uh, linkages, the uh, linkages uh, domestic and, uh, and international. Uh, for example, how had they been destroyed during the uh, recession? How had they been repaired? Uh, certainly, we have been looking at low wage, uh, low inflation uh, puzzles and AI's contribution to that. Uh, there's uh, Cavallo 2018 looks at this. The possibility of greater, faster propagation of shocks due to this greater international exposure. So uh, Eric has worked on this. Uh, I mentioned your paper at Jackson Hole, by the way, Eric. And then uh, Caval uh, 2018. So there are some big uh, macro questions that are uh, coming up as a result of uh, AI, are they connected to AI in uh, some way. Oh, by the way, uh, the second thing that I thought we should do before starting is that since we're sharing images of family businesses, here's mine. So, um, so uh, the, the vintage, I had this in a high school. Uh, this is the outgrowth of an extracurricular chemistry uh, project. And uh, you can tell how old it is because I have an AOL address. <laughs> so I just want to put this work in perspective. So we have been talking about at a, a, a higher uh, level with some examples, uh, the kinds of important decisions that are being uh, used with AI, or AI is being used for. Uh, ride sharing, this is the, the Lyft uh, paper earlier this year, uh, finding that, that uh, African Americans, for example, had greater and low income people had uh, greater access to ride sharing as a result of, of uh, Lyft's platform. Uh, health that we saw from Sindel earlier today, criminal trials, uh, judicial discussion that Bo just presented, and corporate governance that we just saw as well. Um, not yet for monetary policy. I said not yet. Um, the issue of the black box is the, uh, I think, the rubric under which the, the notion that these two papers, this, these uh, sets of papers, uh, are addressing. And they go in and out, data go in and out of these algorithms, and we really don't know what's happening. And this is not a good thing for important decisions. But it may not be a large issue for uh, inconsequential uh, tasks. However, it could be a large issue, especially if there is an important decision that is made and it requires an appeal, it requires some explanation. So they approach these in uh, different ways. Uh, and the question is whether the output is uh, input into the decision or the actual decision maker. Now, I would, I would say from having read the two papers, um, it's not clear whether this is completely outsourced or, or not. There, there's no prescription, I think, there. I think we're learning. In both papers, we're, uh, we're learning. Possibly refinement in both of them uh, to understand the uh, decisions uh, better. So let's just talk briefly about the two papers, and um, I'll move on to what I would conclude from them as well. So I uh, think I can skip this because I think they covered this, uh, this pretty well. This is uh, what they find is that their model works better than the benchmark model in terms of uh, using the attributes that are most relevant, like profitability, uh, like 
uh, being elected uh, later on, and this would be prefer preferred by uh, shareholders. So they can actually improve on the benchmark model. So uh, Bo looks at these uh, criminal cases in Broward County. I think this is a really um, interesting paper in that it does directly what we're uh, talking about with respect to the training data using historical data. This feedback loop is something that has not been, I think, paid enough attention to, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. So again, these are just uh, his, uh, his results. So one thing that I wanted to uh, highlight was that, uh, as Bo said, those doing work on algori al algorithmic bias argue that decision-making al al algorithms may create this feedback loop, and this may in turn influence outcomes codified into training data for future outcomes. So we have some emerging research, though not a lot, from uh, three quarters from industry, for example, Microsoft Research, um, from nonprofits and from the uh, academy, but this is emerging research. Several recommendations have been put forward uh, that I'd like to mention to combat uh, algorithmic bias. Uh, one is to develop AI uh, in an ethical fair and fair way. There has to be diversity in both training data as well as developer teams including from different um, uh, disciplines, and this should be prioritized. Second, there should be an impact assessment done with these algorithms in the design review processes for new software as well as consequent um, updates. I'm not mentioning the regulatory one. I think that that is a bit more controversial, but I think that these have uh, uh, quite a bit of support in the research that I read. So how do we combat this. Um, Google has set up AI um, or has supported uh, AI for all these camps for underrepresented minorities and women who would like to learn AI. Uh, there's girls who code, black girls who code, um, but I think that these uh, these efforts that are leading to increasing supply are wonderful and they look good, but the pipeline is leaky. That's something that we've learned uh, in economics and certainly something that has been uh, brought to the fore uh, by the Alice Wu paper last year. One thing that I know from my research is that uh, URM women constitute the smallest share of groups in s and &E occupations, and they also have the highest unemployment. So it's not just, again, the pipeline. It is the leaky pipeline such that people are not uh, employed. Um, so this is just showing us uh, what is, uh, what the shares uh, are, URM women are down here, and these are Hispanic and African American women, 2% uh, each. So I'm excited and terrified by the notion that Amazon, Facebook, and other AI intensive firms are recruiting economists and uh, graduate students. I retweeted Susan's call for more of these economists without thinking about it, because I retweet everything that she does, just like I retweet everything that, that Joshua and, and uh, do uh, retweet. But I, upon a reflection, think we have some baggage. So if you'll remember from uh, Janet Yellen talking about the financial crisis, we came from, the people who were studying it came from similar schools. They were similar people. They had similar experiences with the economy. The San Francisco Fed started collecting data on the people who were not like us, and I think she would uh, readily say that her predictions were informed uh, by this interaction and this information, and hers were the best among the uh, Federal, uh, Federal Reserve policymakers. So we have some anecdotal evidence. Uh, many of you have probably listened to Stacey Philpott Brown or uh, Ellen Powell talking about their experiences in Silicon Valley. Uh, my co-author and I, uh, Siobhan Logan, couldn't find our grandparents, our grandfathers in the census data, and we keep talking to economic historians and others about not relying on the census or knowing about the biases in censuses, but we haven't uh, found a general acceptance of that. 
Um, so I think that these are problems that we're carrying with us. These data are being linked to many different data sets. So I think that the training data are uh, potentially biased in this way. We have new research in economics about same ethnicity TAs, uh, more women teachers in uh, Korea, and uh, just one more slide. And then uh, Francis and uh, co-authors find that black girls are the least recommended for AP calculus, which is the gateway to economics and to uh, to college and to economics. So I appreciate the recruitment of economists, but we need to check our orientation and practices as economists, not just as those studying economics. This is highlighted by the recent tweet that went viral that some of you all participated in by the economics undergraduate student who is African American and who was asking about doing a PhD in economics and who was actively being discouraged by her professor. So many black women shared their experiences in economics departments as undergraduate students, graduate students, and faculty. And as Donna Ginther says, we are the furthest from power. And this comes from the, uh, the review of NIH funding, uh, the NIH funding process. We have to be aware of these biases that our economists are taking to the algorithms themselves. And these have to be scrutinized at tech firms and elsewhere. So thank you, and thank you for the work that you're doing at this pivotal moment. And uh, I'm tweeting about my research and yours at Lisa D. Cook.